Hey everybody, welcome to WASM Day. I, I'm uh, so pumped to be here. Uh, the first time I ever spoke at a conference was actually uh, WASM Day in LA. Uh, so it's really special to me to, to be back here. Um, I'm Bailey Hayes. I am the CTO at Cosmonic. Uh, I also serve as the WASI co-chair for the W3C's community group. I'm also on the technical steering committee of the Bike Code Alliance. Uh, but today, I want to talk about uh, whether or not this moment in time right now is the Docker moment for WebAssembly. And you might be thinking, did Liam write that? Uh, and the, the answer is maybe. Uh, he asked me this question at the end of my last talk, and it's been an earworm and it's really stuck in my mind. Uh, and uh, I think that it's worth talking about um, because there are a lot of aspects here that are really important and there are a lot of similar parallels. The early days of the cloud native uh, age, uh, we were really inspired by the paper around Borg, but in reality, there were many different innovations that happened over a decade that made us have this massive uh, moment uh, in time where you saw a lot of the infrastructure and everything come together uh, and sort of uh, revolve around this one concept of a container. And that's, I think, because the future is often already here. It just isn't evenly distributed. So not one place, not one time, not one company, but many different innovators working together to find the right abstraction. And when I, when I kind of think about how software development works as an industry, it's really the world's largest, most complex multiplayer sport. And sometimes it looks like this, where it's maybe a little bit more complicated than you would want it to be. And maybe somebody introduces a new technique and everybody adopts it, but it might, you know, be complicated. Uh, but in reality, that's how we're so successful. That's how we keep raising the bar. And because we're in Paris and the Olympics are coming, that made me think of, of this one example that happened in the 19, let's see, 1968 Summer Olympics. And that's when Dick Fosbury uh, showed the, on the world stage the Fosbury flop. But the Fosbury flop actually had been around. It had shown up in some different competitions, but it wasn't until a lot of people saw this and had their aha moment that this is you know, something that we could do to really raise the bar of uh, our level of competition. What I really like about the Fosbury Flops Wikipedia page, because I had to go look it up, uh, is that there were many different techniques that were uh, in use at the time. And to me, that seemed a whole lot like the way that we were doing lots of different virtualization technologies in the 2000s and 2010s. Uh, I'll name a few of them. That's the straddle technique, the western roll, and the eastern cutoff, or the scissors jump. So uh, if it feels like sometimes when we're looking across our landscape of a lot of different ways to do and ship software, uh, turns out that applies to just about everything. And so I really loved uh, that analogy. So new techniques obviously uh, will unlock new levels of play, both in software and uh, you know maybe in the Olympics. But uh, what I think for us, the most important concept to keep in mind is what Thomas Kuhn said in his book for the structure of scientific revolutions. And it's that he described a moment of innovation where suddenly the world seems to be different, and that is a paradigm shift. And I believe that the paradigm shift for us is happening right now, and it's around WebAssembly components and with the launch of WASI.2. And a few reasons, but I'll only name a few because you've got the rest of the day. Uh, it's because things are now language interoperable, so that I can take two components written in two totally different languages and have them talk to each other. And the way that I do that is with interfaces. And what I really love about these interfaces, and I'm going to hit it a little bit more later, is that they're strictly defined, they're semantic, I can pass in high-level types, but I can also do that in a way that lets me bring it across all of these language uh, barriers. So um, that is all defined over this uh, uh, IDL called WIT. Now, uh, this next slide you may have seen before, but I can't give a talk with this title 
without at least addressing it, which is uh, Solomon Hikes, who uh, was one of the founders of Docker. He said that if WASM and WASI existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create Docker. I totally agree. Uh, but uh, we did create Docker, right? We, we've been building at it. We're, we're at CNCF, we're at Cloud Native. Um, so uh, does that mean that components are irrelevant? Or is this really uh, talking about that period of evolution that happens with technology and that maybe we're finally hitting that moment, that paradigm shift? Uh, and the reason why I believe it's important and why we need to, to rally around it now is that the reality is that the way that we build software is broken. I said that building software is the world's largest multiplayer sport, but if it's a multiplayer sport, we're not exactly playing at the best because uh, we're, we're making really tiny little teams. Uh, our court is filled with spikes and barriers and all kinds of stuff that keeps us from working together. And one of those examples is the way that we build up language silos, where if I'm coding in Go and my friend Taylor is coding in Rust, it's not really convenient or idiomatic to be able to collaborate on sharing libraries, sharing code. The way that we do that today is maybe we uh, instantiate an API in front of our code, we, we, we put uh, maybe HTTP in front of it, and we sort of force everything through uh, this one API uh, style. But when you, when you actually look at it, you're like, wait, hold on. Uh, it's not just languages, it's our package managers, it's our all the frameworks and libraries, like are you using Tokyo and Rust or are you using <laughs> a different version of async? That's one example. Um, maybe it even uh, eliminates the types of platforms that you're able to run on. Um, and even if you just say, oh, just put an API on it, it's so easy, it's fine. Uh, well, you know, hey, are you using gRPC? Are you using REST? Uh, are you following a standard for your REST APIs? Uh, it gets complicated. And if you're looking at this slide and you're thinking like, whoa, that's just like a lot of stuff that like feels really stressful, you really cluttered that slide. Well, to me, I did that on purpose because that's how I feel the current landscape of software development is today. And if we go back to something that I think a lot of us have really internalized for how to solve this problem, because we've been grappling with it for a long time, uh, in the Unix philosophy, there are three key tenets. And if you write software according to those tenets, uh, you are probably finding a really great way to build software that is multiplayer. And that is write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs that work well together, uh, and this last one is the only one I have a little bit of a quibble with, and it is write programs to handle text streams as streams because that's the universal interface. And so somewhat similar to how we have all of our microservices today forced through one type of approximation of your API, you're kind of like shoving a, a square peg in a round hole. Uh, I feel that that's sort of the same idea here where we are saying everything just needs to be text according to the Unix philosophy. Um, but like I just said, we are building our microservices not exactly like the Unix philosophy. And I wonder, you know, hey, why? And I need to shout out, like Unix tools, amazing. Chef's kiss, it works great. But when we're looking at software that we're building today, uh, you know, it, we've learned that we need uh, APIs that are version. We need semantic information about the different calls that we're making, and it's the only way to write maintainable and scalable software. So how do we get to that? Well, you can probably guess what I'm going to say. It's, it's obviously, to me, the WebAssembly component model. Because with the component model, you're able to write things that do one thing and does, does it really well. Not just like really well, I think in, in, the, in the limit, we're gonna see certain components that are literally the best component because it's the fastest, it's the smallest, it has the best API. It won't matter what language it's written in other than maybe the languages that are extremely performant, have a tiny uh, footprint, are probably going to be the ones that everybody sort of revolves around. Uh, but what we're going to be able to do is have components that can slot into any application that solves the problem better than anything else. And it's going to be very tiny, very isolated to the specific problem domain that it's trying to solve. And so our applications will combine all of these. Now, 
The second part, because we're trying to solve for the world's largest multiplayer sport, let's make sure that we write programs that work well together. And clearly, being able to compose components that are able to run together is incredibly important for that goal. Uh, and so if we look at, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily knocking the problem of having to run over a transport, but to me the problem is that I'm not able to today say exactly what this program is going to do and how I can consume that information. If the API is not enough. Um, and the reason why I say that is if I look at the way that I deploy my microservices today and I put an API in front of it, it's going to take maybe you know, several milliseconds to call. If I'm even on the same network, that's pretty fast. Uh, but because components isolate the memory, so uh, when I compose two components together, uh, and let's say they're using the exact same environment variables, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, it definitely has happened to me where I was trying to set some port, it had the, you know, everybody exposed the environment variable port, uh, and then when I was using a third party library, you know, who gets the port and how do I map it to the right thing? That's really an uh, annoying part of it. Uh, I guess another example would be, let's say you're using a Python library, you're pulling in a bunch of stuff, uh, and then at some point somebody clobbers your module. Uh, that can happen, especially when you're pulling in third party libraries. So by Taking the superpower of WebAssembly, of being able to create a sandbox that completely isolates that module, I have separate linear memories for each one. And that allows me to make programs that work so well together that they're able to run in the exact same process. And I'm able to call from one component to another in nanoseconds. Now, this last one is that third point of the Unix philosophy that I had a little bit of a, a, an issue with, and that's, uh, I agree, we have to have a universal interface. But to me, the universal interface is WIT, the WebAssembly interface types. And that's something that we standardized around uh, with WASI.2. Uh, and we launched it with two different worlds. Inside those worlds, you can think of it as targeting a specific environment. The WASI CLI world is the one that's very similar to what we had originally released in 2019 with WASI Preview 1. And that uh, basically gives you a lot of the things that you need to run as a CLI. It's even called WASI colon CLI as the package. It gives you things like a file system, being able to talk to standard in, standard out, uh, and you're able to run it kind of like you would run any other CLI. Uh, you can embed WASM time and, and do it, or you can use uh, WASM time CLI directly and say WASM time run. But there's this other world that's pretty different, actually, from the WASI CLI world, and that's WASI HTTP proxy. And that allows us to write to a different abstraction. It doesn't pull in sockets. It actually is completely isolated to just HTTP interfaces. That's what that component, if it targets that world, it says, hey, I export an incoming handler. Uh, you know, that's the way that you can call me, and I only speak HTTP. Uh, I love that. I, you know, I kind of knocked HTTP a little bit earlier. If you thought I did, I wasn't. Uh, what I was saying is that let's be really clear about what these components are building, what they're targeting, and what their lingua franca is. And so uh, you're able to pass in basically these high-level types. And to open up the hood a little bit and look at, at what that is, uh, this is an example of what a component looks like, rendering with WAD. Uh, it's got uh, some interesting things, but my favorite here is to always highlight that this, this whole thing, this new WebAssembly component model, it's all still based on the WebAssembly core specification. Underneath, uh, you still see I32s as far as the eye can see. Uh, that, that's the original types that you worked with. I remember writing some of my own bind gens to kind of like shove a string in from JavaScript into uh, my C++ WASM module. Uh, so I was personally very excited to have these top level interfaces. Uh, in this case, this is kind of like if I had, a, uh, had targeted the WASI CLI run, uh, WASI CLI command world. Uh, it would export this run function that now anything that wants to work with me knows that's what I do. I, ru I run, <laughs> that's it, <laughs> just once. You can't call me again, and uh, not only that, but um, you know, I need an environment that's kind of specific for me to be able to run, and that's with my imports, and that's really powerful. Now, 
if, if that uh, is where we are with the component model, that does not answer at all <laughs> how this could possibly be the Docker moment because there have been many other abstractions that are really similar to this. I get asked a lot, didn't Java do this? Didn't Com do this? Didn't Cobra do this? Lots and lots and lots, right? Um, but the reality is that lots of innovators come together and we keep iterating, right? And we keep working together until we build the next abstraction. And to me, that's really why Docker was so widely successful is that it had this amazing community. When I realized that there was such a thing as a Docker moment, for me personally, was when I went to my local meetup and we had a Docker champion there. Uh, it was maybe 2014, maybe 2015. And at the time, I was working on this really compli complicated tool chain because uh, it was building my C++ stuff, throwing in some JavaScript. It was Asm.js, which is really the precursor to WebAssembly. And I was constantly having this problem of, hey, it works on my machine. And everybody else is like, this is black magic. Um, so I believe that having a community and having people onboard other people who are really excited about Docker at the time, the Docker champions really led the way uh, in building a community. But at that tech meetup, not only did I just build my first container, I built a container that I immediately shared with the person next to me. And that was my like aha moment. Like, wow, okay, I can build something that's portable. We've since learned that it's not perfectly portable, but it's, it was wildly portable at the time. Um, and so that was a really special paradigm shift in, in, in the, basically the industry. Uh, so building on community, collaboration, uh, and it was very developer-centric. It solved the problems that I had that day. It added a new tool to my toolbox. But really, to me, what was the thing that was the paradigm shift? How do we know that that's happening? Well, we, we know it's happening when you have many different companies and organizations come together and say, yeah, let's standardize around this. Let's make it interoperable across all of our different platforms. And you can see that happening today. So my call to action, like, let's do this. Let's start building better together, building WebAssembly components. And if you want to know how you can get involved, there's a lot of different ways. In particular, I think WASI is one area that's extremely exciting, and I'm biased as a co-chair, but trust me on this one. Uh, WASI.2, it launched January 24th. It's actively being added to many different uh, standard language library tool chains, uh, which basically means it's got to be stable. It's got several years of support. So it's a stable foundation that it's time. You can come and build on it. Uh, there's this other aspect here that maybe is a little bit different if you were familiar with WASI Preview 1, and that's where we're actually going to be doing many uh, time-based releases, regular releases that add only additive, non-breaking changes to WASI. And that's going to let us really accelerate our development and our growth on this, and I believe add features that the community needs now uh, and be able to consume it very soon. Uh, so I'm, I'm extremely excited about that, and that's really what's going to evolve, I think, just the developer experience, adding new tools, uh, help us add new languages to the ecosystem. And uh, my goal really is to see this go and be extensible everywhere. So on top of the dot two foundations, we're gonna see several new worlds. Uh, some of them are gonna be talked about today, uh, including WASI Cloud, WASI Embedded World for running on embedded devices, WASI NN for doing neural networking and inferencing, uh, being able to run GPU workloads with WASI WebGPU. So it's so much more than just those first two worlds that launched. These will likely come online this year. And so to me, that means we're going to see an application evolution across our stack. But I don't want you to think that uh, when I say here a platform revolution, just like what happened with Docker, where we saw uh, basically all the platforms were reorganized to orchestrate containers at every scale, uh, the platforms of tomorrow, in my opinion, are going to be orchestrated around components. Uh, so when I say we're going to create a revolution here, I don't mean this one, uh, but I do mean uh, being able to do this across many different foundations, including the CNCF and the Bytecode Alliance and others, uh, and work together because we've got this one thing that's interoperable across all these different ecosystems and stacks. Um, 
And you might be thinking, okay, maybe it's just the start of this, right? Like, okay, it's very early days. I've tried to use this stuff maybe a month ago and it was kind of frictionful. And I can assure you when I tried things in 2014, I felt some bugs and rough edges. Uh, that is definitely the case, but it's evolving so fast. And, and really this WASM native revolution is happening right now. It's already here. Uh, if you look across the CNCF landscape, I can see so many different little shoots of WASM popping up everywhere. Uh, it is not isolated to one runtime that's doing this. It's not one group or organization. It's across all of us. And that's really, for me, our paradigm shift. So if you want to get involved, please go to uh, the workshop that shows two different CNCF projects that show you how to build your first WebAssembly component. And also check out the component model book. I think it's a really great resource for learning more about how to get started with components. Um, and if you do all that, one, thank you. Uh, my, my biggest call to action to you is to go and add WASI to a target for your favorite library and make it part of our ecosystem. It's gonna take everybody everywhere to do this, but I think we can do it. And it's gonna be incredibly powerful because the only way to build software is to build it better together. Thank you. Wow, Bailey, knocking it out. Um, you were talking about uh, Unix, right? Uh, and like it or not, the standard is still C compatibility. Uh, how do you think, why do you think developers should make library for WebAssembly components instead of FFI or C compatibility? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, one, um, I actually intentionally snuck this one in there just, uh, just in case I got asked this. Um, so I'm gonna go way back. Okay, you see this? I snuck in libc right here. <laughs> um, and, and I did that on purpose because, you know what, I'm not saying don't do this. Do it. If it works for the type of ecosystem that you're running in, you can make any type of interface you want. Uh, what I want to see in WASI, and now this is an open standard, open community, so it's not just what I want, although, you know, uh, it would be great if it was. Uh, I, I really want to see that we design interfaces that are fine-grained, right? I don't want to fall into the pitfalls of past mistakes. I think that we can build a foundation that is capability-driven and capability-safe. Those are key principles. Dan Goman, who uh, really was one of the, the key creators of WASI, uh, he followed a thing called Cloud ABI. And that was all around how do we build basically these interfaces in a way that we're only giving away the capabilities that it absolutely needs. There's going to be a really great talk on a little bit more detail on that with live demos uh, later today. So I don't want to give too many spoilers, uh, but why not Libc? Um, because it gives a very broad footprint. It kind of forces everything into that one singular, well, singular 500 and what, 26 syscalls <laughs> uh, uh, API versus that one semantic ABI, API that the component maybe needs to expose. Do you want to follow up on that one? So you mean it's just one machine, one virtual machine instead of uh, one interface? Yeah, so instead of having a really broad set of things that you got to pull in and depend on, let's get it to this, like, the exactly thing that you need. And that way, as a platform operator, because I work at Cosmonic, it's a managed PaaS, I really want to know, hey, is your component trying to use sockets, for example, which would be available if, if they use something like all of POSIX? Uh, that's um, something that I need to know so that I know how to sandbox it. But what I want to see with these components is that if they build exactly their semantic API and they don't pull in something like HTTP, I can take the exact same component and run it inside a, a UDF, inside a database uh, that doesn't need a big, big overhead, right? I want something that's itty bitty, right? So that I can run it in the exact same process as my query processing engine. And I want to take that exact same component and run it in a TypeScript application running in the web. And I want to run it server side and I want to be able to scale it out everywhere. Uh, hello. Uh, so I just have a question about the communication. Uh, if we use WASM everywhere, can we completely avoid gRPC or uh, uh, any other 
GraphQL or REST, like you know, completely avoid and use completely Vasi and uh, uh, which is, is it possible in the near future? Yeah, I, I want to give a shout out to a tool that uh, Yash uh, created, and we're going to bring into the Bytecode Alliance, I believe, and, and he called it uh, uh, Wasm HTTP Tools, where you can take a WIT and produce an open API document, so you can do REST calls and, and back again. Uh, so WIT is very much designed to be machine readable, so we can do a lot of these different existing transports without having to necessarily change them, right? I can create components that talk to the services that I have today, uh, but I am a big fan of the idea that maybe we could just have everything be WebAssembly component native. Thank you for bringing this, making this live. I have a maybe not very comfortable question for you. Okay. I personally dream of a world where containers are gone and data scientists no longer do Python. Um, <laughs> and I, I really hope that this is the killer for it. And I also think that one of the things that you didn't mention that made Docker very successful, that it made Python usable in production. Uh, and uh, especially data science applications. But what is the state of WASI support for C Python? And um, are we going to see maybe in the near future something like uh, components for most common data science libraries like sklearn and being able to run data science applications using WASM uh, components rather than a silo? of libraries piled into the container praying for it to complete with zero exit code. There is a lot of innovation happening in this space, kind of back to the same theme of uh, you'll see many different shoots of innovation uh, doing things in different ways. I would like to start, I guess, maybe it was two years ago or, yeah, about two years ago, uh, one of my coworkers, Kevin Smith at Single Store had uh, taken the CPython interpreter and compiled it down into a WASM module. Uh, and then um, several different maintainers that actually worked on CPython were working on the, like, the exact same thing at the same time. Uh, later, that's, that's evolved quite a bit. It's been moving through the phases. Uh, it's totally usable today. Uh, and our friends at Fermion, uh, Joel Dice, has been doing a lot of amazing work on both making things work with WASI libc and then also uh, extending the basically the developer experience for building Python components. And that's what the tool called Componentize Pi. And you can check that out inside the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, but basically, by being able to bring over not just Python, I think that's the real trick with uh, data science. Um, and I'm guessing maybe you're a Polar's fan. Uh, Polar RS is pretty cool. Uh, but uh, if you look at the types of libraries that people bring in for Python, it's not Python. <laughs> it, it, it can be uh, C++, it can be all this native stuff. It can be Fortran. It's often Fortran. Uh, so you need to be able to uh, not just bring over Python, you've got to bring over that whole ecosystem. And so the only last person I'll give a shout out to is the Pyodide folks. They've been porting basically the entire data science stack to make this a reality. Spicy question and a great one. Let's keep these coming, we've got a few more minutes on these. I think the component model is very interesting. I kind of want to tap into the question about like network communication because I mean in, in Kubernetes and, and what, what do we have like everything is kind of in the, in, the, in the idea of the 12 factor app. Everything needs to be exposed as a network service but I've never done Erlang I have to admit but uh, Erlang has this wild model of it just runs distributed and you can just swap out function. Is that something that we see eventually with WebAssembly because I see the potential for it that oh we don't care about the network anymore. The, the network is just there but we as a developer don't need to care about it. Yes, uh, it kind of feels like you're reading some of the minds on my team. Um, I don't want to spoil things so I can't say too 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 much. Uh, I will say that Yes, with components, you can kind of expect the interconnectivity fabric to be flat. That's just not something that a developer needs to worry about. We can generate the HTTP protocol that it needs to use. We can generate the gRPC. We can generate whatever special sauce we need to run it in a database. Uh, 
what's important and what I think we're going to see coming in, in the next year or so is platforms that understand components natively and know how to distribute and scale them uh, for the given workload. So to answer your question, you know, do, does HTTP and services go away? I don't think so, right? I think the, the key that made Docker so successful is that I could run it on my bare metal Linux box that was already running all my other workloads. I just started kind of doing the lift and shift pattern. Uh, it wasn't cloud native when I when I took the first container that I shoved my entire Spring Boot app in there, and it was like two gigabytes or something crazy. Uh, and and then and then it was running, and then I was like, okay, that's pretty awesome, but you know, we should break down that monolith. Uh, I think we're going to see the exact same patterns, right? We're going we're gonna to see the strangular pattern of bringing components, making it compatible with the existing ecosystems that we have, and then uh, extending it out to the future.